So a really big welcome to everybody to Biodiversity Week. And um, we are really delighted to have you here with us. Uh, my name is Claire Patton. I've probably been emailing you um, coordinate the biodiversity theme. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Rob Nelson. And um, so we'll both be here throughout the week with you. Um, and we also have really two really uh, brilliant guest speakers, um, Trisha Beecher um, and Eamon Toomey. And they're both conservation rangers in different national parks. And um, so I'll be handing over in a sec. But just before we get into the the um, the webinar today, just a little bit of information for you about what else we have going on this week. Um, so today is the first of four webinars. So we've got a webinar every day um, from Monday to Thursday this week. And um, they're all starting at 11. And um, you can find out more about them on the event page, and which is there and which will pop into the chat box as well. But you can register to come along to as many as you like. And um, if you can't make one of them later this week, um, they will be recorded um, and put up on our YouTube channel. So you can watch them back if you miss them and they'll appear there on that event page later on. And we also have got um, an action of the day for each day that we hope lots of you can do. Um, and to help you with that, um, there's a little activity sheet that has a few suggestions um, of resources that might help you um, along with some short um, videos. So maybe if there's some classes I couldn't make today's webinar, they can get a little taster of some of the things that the, the guys are going to talk about. And um, so today's action is to go out and do a litter pick in your local park or woodland or even in your school grounds. Um, and you might hear a little bit um, as we go on about why it is so important. Um, so we mentioned that there's no live webinar on Friday, but we do have a series of brilliant draw along videos um, done by Rob here. Um, and they're available in Irish and English. Um, so if you want to learn how to draw some of the animals you're going to hear about this week, um, including um, something that Trish is going to talk about, the white-tailed eagle. So they're really nice um, videos for you to try. Um, and they are up now. If you can't wait until Friday, you can give it a go later today. Um, and just a, a tiny bit of housekeeping, um, just to please keep your microphones um, on mute. We do have a, a pretty big group today, um, but we do want to hear from you. So use the, the chat box if you want to ask or answer any questions. Um, and as I mentioned, this session is being recorded, but we're only going to use the video of the presenters. So don't worry if your camera is on, you won't be featured in the video. Um, and as I said, this is, I'm only talking for this two minutes, so we're going to hand over to our speakers now. So um, in a second, we're going to start off with um, Trisha Beecher, who is in Killarney National Park. Um, and then after that, we're going to hear from Eamon Toomey, who's in the Byrne National Park. And when both speakers are finished, um, we will then have a chance for a Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat as you think of them, or you can wait until the end and ask them then. But we'll we'll take a good few questions at the end. So get your, your thinking caps on for anything that you would like to know about. Um, OK, guys, so that's it for me. I'm going to hand over um, to Tricia now um, and hopefully you all enjoy. Thanks, Claire. Um, so I'll just start by sharing my screen. So let me know if you can see the presentation there okay yep perfect perfect thanks very much so good morning everyone um as claire said my name is trisha beecher and i'm a conservation ranger with national parks and wildlife service uh, for just over a year now and i work in killarney national park so my job as a conservation ranger is very diverse uh, we have lots of different jobs that we do from um, being a duty ranger and patrolling the park and looking after everything um, to issuing permits for kayaks um, maybe looking at the invasive species management for things like rhododendron in the park and also some of the fun things like wildlife surveys and habitat management. So every day is different and we spend a lot of time outdoors which is great especially on days like today when it's nice and sunny here in Killarney as well um, and at this time of year. So I'm here today to talk about a really exciting project it's the white-tailed eagle project and I've been very lucky to be a part of this project since I started here in the park. Um, so it's a reintroduction project and it's been ongoing in Killarney National Park for the last 17 years. So 
I'll start today with a little bit of background. Um, before I start talking about the project itself, we'll just talk a little bit about white-tailed eagles and um, some facts about them. Um, so they are part of a family called the Acipitridae family. So that is a family that consists of 234 different types of eagles and hawks. And they range from smaller um, birds like sparrowhawk to very large eagles as well. So they all have um, characteristic strong hooked bill and they have that for hunting live prey. So depending on the species, that could be something like from eating worms and beetles to things like bats and fish as well. Um, so their Latin name is Heliatus albicilla, and each species in the world has a Latin name and a common name. And I suppose the reason for the Latin name is that it stays the same worldwide, um, while the common name can differ from different countries and different parts of the world. Um, for example, the white-tailed eagle is also known as the white-tailed sea eagle in some places. Um, and then things like maybe the robin that we have here um, is a completely different bird to the robin in America. So there's a European robin and a North American robin. So if you Google the two of them, you'll see that there's some differences between them. So that's why everything has a Latin name as well as a common name. Um, so back to the white-tailed eagle again, they are the largest bird of prey in Ireland and they can live for over 20 years, which is pretty impressive. Um, so they are distributed across uh, Europe, Russia, Greenland, and parts of Asia as well. So you can see here in the map on the top right of the screen, that will be their, their distribution. Um, so all the way, as you see from Greenland, through Ireland, Scotland, and all across Europe, Russia, and, and parts of Asia. As said. Um, so they live in a variety of different habitats, and that can range from coastal areas, um, inland water bodies like the lakes and Killarney, uh, rivers, upland areas and wetlands. So they kind of tend to spread across a few different habitats. And white-tailed eagles, they establish territories and their territories can be up to 70 kilometers squared. Um, so those territories are often smaller in places like Norway when, where their white-tailed eagle is plentiful. Um, but in places like Ireland, where they mightn't have as many established pairs, they can they can roam and range for quite a, a distance. Um, so they like to nest high up in trees or on cliff edges. Um, but all of the white-tailed eagles that we know are nesting in Ireland are nesting high up in trees. Um, so they like to eat fish. Um, they are actually good fishers. So they spend a lot of their time fishing and hunting around the lakes. Um, so they also eat things like carrion. So if they find um, dead animals, they will scavenge on them. And this could be maybe deer in the national park, or if it was more coastal area, it might be things like seals. Um, and they're very large birds, as mentioned, and their wingspan can be up to 2.4 meters, which is pretty, pretty wide. And their body length can be up to a meter. Um, so I've just included this diagram here to show you the, the scale of the white tail eagle in comparison with a buzzard and a golden eagle. So they're all quite um, big birds. You might have seen buzzards around. They'd be a bit more common than the white tailed eagle. Uh, but you can just see the difference here in the scale for in this picture. So they make their nests from sticks and um, both adults um, help to build a nest. So their nests are really, really big, and that's understandable, I suppose, when you think about having yeah, one to two adult eagles landing on the nest and also the space for either one, two, or even in rare cases, three chicks. Um, so their eggs are laid in March or April, and they take about 35 to 38 days to hatch. And both parents are on incubation duties before the eggs actually hatch. And they also have to keep the chicks warm for up to five weeks until the chicks are after are able to regulate their own temperature as well. So the white-tailed eagle was once widespread around Ireland, um, but they became extinct due to persecution. So they were actually hunted out. Um, and the last known nest recorded in the wild in Ireland was in County Mayo in 1910. So this picture here um, on the slide is a picture of an adult white-tailed eagle in its nest in the wild in Killarney National Park. Um, I suppose it's you know not very easy to see it, but maybe just to take a note of the coloration of, of the head of the eagle there as well, because we'll talk about that in a couple more slides as well. 
So before I start talking about the reintroduction project, I'm just going to show you a little video. Um, and this is from the project itself. It just shows some of the work that takes place throughout the project. We can do the other one now. Yeah. Trying to open that. two chicks in the nest and it's one of those famous nest sites that goes down with that will go down in the lore of the history of the white tailed eagle project reintroduction phase one and two because we have our, uh, the parents where Cayman was the male who was released in 2008 in Killarney National Park and that release site and uh, B Bernardine was released in 2020 from the reintroduction phase two. And the remarkable thing about it is that B is just three years of age. Okay, so that's just to kind of give you um, a taste of what the work is like, and um, I'll discuss it a little bit more um, as we go through. So there were two phases to the white-tailed um, eagle reintroduction project, and the first phase took place between 2007 and 2011. And over that time, 100 white-tailed eagle chicks were released in Killarney National Park. And when those chicks were released, uh, they all dispersed all over Ireland, um, a lot of them up the West Coast um, and some established territories in counties Kerry, Cork and Clare. So the photograph on this slide here is of a, an adult white-tailed eagle. And when white-tailed eagles become adults, they have a lighter colour feathers around the head and neck area um, and in comparison with the chicks. So they're much darker overall. And the white-tailed eagles only develop that distinctive white tail after about three to four years. And you can see here that it has a completely yellow beak as well. Um, so the first known breeding pair to establish from the project was um, near Loch Derg in 2012, and they successfully fledged chicks. And um, by July 2020, uh, 31 known chicks had fledged in the wild in Ireland. Um, so that, I suppose, shows the success of the project, the fact that we have breeding pairs and fledging chicks in the wild that, that really shows that the project is starting to take off. And at that stage, there were around eight to 10 pairs of white-tailed eagles in the wild in Ireland. And um, you can see this photo, as you can probably guess from what I've explained about the adults in the previous slide, um, this is actually a white-tailed eagle chick. So you can see the, the difference in the coloration of the feathers around the head in comparison with the adult in the last photo. And you can also see it has some downy white feathers, which they lose over the first few months. Um, and the beak itself is much darker and only starting to appear yellow around the mouth. And that will be completely yellow when it becomes an adult. And you can also see the hook on its beak here very well, um, which I mentioned earlier was a characteristic of the Acipitridae family. So the second phase of the project um, is taking place between 2020 and 2024. And so far in this phase, uh, 71 white-tailed eagle chicks have been released into the wild. Um, as well as Clarny National Park, there are some new release sites this time around. Um, so there's one near Loch Derg, uh, there's one in the Shannon Estuary, and there's one in the west of Ireland. Um, so conservation rangers will be very busy again this summer looking after white-tailed eagle chicks. Uh, we receive one brood of chicks each year. And the photo here shows the chicks being tagged, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in the next few slides. Um, so the white-tailed eagle chicks come from Norway. Um, they are collected from uh, wild nests in Norway, and they're brought to Ireland on a private plane and collected at the airport by NPWS staff. Um, so they have to be checked over by a vet first on arrival to make sure that everything went OK. And uh, then they're transported to specially built pens or cages um, where they will stay for a few weeks. 
So there's a nest uh, made on a platform in the pens and they have branches as well. They're placed in there. So you can kind of see those in the photograph there um, and they hop between the branches. Um, so it's trying to kind of recreate what it would be similar, you know, to be in the wild for them in a tree. So the photo here is of juvenile white-tailed eagles in one of the pens. And um, they're held in captivity when they arrive for around five to six weeks until they're strong enough to take their first flight. So they don't actually, they haven't actually flown um, themselves before they reach Ireland. Um, so when they reach here, then uh, they're just handled when they are placed in the cages and on the day that they have to be tagged. Um, so the conservation rangers have to feed them fresh fish twice a day, um, or early in the morning and later in the evening. And um, we observe their behavior and we get to know what they're like. Um, but they're fed through a little hatch and observed through a little spy hatch. So there's really minimal contact with the birds as we don't want them to get used to being around people. So we observe changes then like the development of their feathers, the strengthening of their wings by wing flapping on the branches and their overall growth. And as soon as they're strong and ready, they are released into the wild and they take their first flight. And um, it's a really exciting, I suppose, waiting behind the cages. We kind of stand out of sight and wait for them to fly out. Um, and it's all hands on deck on the release day. So between opening cages and keeping a watch from vantage points, there's there's plenty of work to keep everybody busy. Um, we have staff on standby in the water in boats and kayaks, as you saw in the video, as every now and again, uh, one of the white-tailed eagles may end up in the water if its first flight doesn't go according to plan. And after spending all that time feeding and observing them, it's a really happy moment for us. So you're absolutely delighted to see them go. And I suppose you do miss the work a bit because you kind of get used to it being part of your day and, and going to observe them. Um, but it really is mission accomplished when they fly off. So it's, it's a great feeling for us all. So um, the eagles are satellite tagged and their location is tracked for the first couple of years. Uh, so you might have noticed what looks like a small backpack on their back in the last photo and video. Um, I'll just pop back for a second. You can see there on the bird on the left. Um, you can see this little kind of box on the back and that's the satellite tag. Um, so we monitor their locations for the first couple of years and it's just to see how they're doing, to see if any of them are you know, near each other or maybe pairing up. Um, and the tags then eventually become loose and just fall off after a few years. They're not actually permanent. Um, so they're also fitted with numbers, uh, numbered and colored tags on the wing. Uh, and that's just to identify them if we see them out and about. Um, so those tags have different colors and different numbers each year. So um, if we can, if we can't read the number, we can still sometimes see the color and it helps us to identify which year um, that particular eagle came from. And uh, this picture is a track of one of the eagles that um, I took from the tracker a while back. And it just gives you an idea of how far these eagles travel. Um, so we've had this one has had taken a couple of trips to Scotland and returned back again. Um, so they are pretty adventurous birds. and They will travel quite a bit in their youth um, before they find a territory and start to, to settle down. So there's just some more older flight paths of white-tailed eagles as well. Um, so the photo on the left is from a white-tailed eagle that was released in 2021. And it has also taken a few trips between Ireland and Scotland over time. Um, but as you can see, it's traveled to pretty much nearly every county around Ireland as well. Um, so that one is particularly adventurous. Um, so then I suppose the one on the right is an eagle that was released in 2022. And that shows that it has uh, looped up as far as Northern Ireland and back down to Kerry. Um, but you can see from the track and how yellow it is on the bottom left of Ireland that it has spent most of its time down and around the Kerry area as well. Um, so I'd imagine that bird could potentially um, set up a territory here down in County Kerry. So that's it. Uh, thank you all for listening. Um, and I suppose just to remind you as well about the daily task today to do the litter pick in your local park or school or woodland, um, because litter is a huge problem for wildlife and especially plastic. And birds in particular are, you know, particularly susceptible to ingesting plastic and getting it confused with food. And it can make them very sick or even be very detrimental to them. So it is very important to keep our countryside litter free if we can. Um, it might seem like a small task, but if every school who takes part in the events for Biodiversity Week gets out and does a litter pick, and it's a huge difference overall. Um, and also, it's such a lovely day to get outdoors today. Um, and when you're out there, be sure to listen out and see if you hear any birds as well. So thank you all.
I just stop sharing now. That's great, Tricia. Thanks so much. Um, really fascinating. See, I, I definitely have loads of questions already. Um, so hopefully uh, some of the guys do as well and we can come back to those um after Eamon's session. So I'm gonna hand over um to you now, Eamon, um, and you should be able to to share your screen and so on. Hi everybody. I'm just gonna share my screen now. And... Yeah, there we go. Hi there. So my name's uh, Eamon Toomey and I'm one of the conservation rangers in the Burr National Park and uh, nature reserves in County Clare. Um, so I've been in this position for just the last six months. I previously spent the last five years um, as the conservation ranger for um, Greater Galway City. So um, much different. So in the park, similar duties to um, what Trish does. So we do surveying and mapping and um, uh, monitoring um, protected species in the areas. And also Joe, um, maintaining um, trails and tracks and um, engaging with the public um, and visitors and some outreach as well to schools. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some of our um, species of bats in Ireland and uh, give you just um, a brief introduction to our nine species and a bit about um, their ecology as well. So what are bats themselves? So um, bats are mammals, so like us. So they are um, warm bodied um, species. Um, they have fur, which is our hair, as we might say, uh, in humans. And the, um, the mothers give birth to live young and generally most of them are fed uh, milk as well. And um, what makes um, bats different from the rest of the mammals are they're the only mammals that um, truly fly. So similar to how birds um, fly, so they're able to propel themselves into flight, unlike maybe some other mammals like flying squirrels and things like that you might have heard, which actually just um, glide, they don't actually fly at all. And bats are a lot more similar to humans than you might think. So we'll have a look at some of the similarities in this slide. So one of the big similarities between um, us and bats is we both have five digits. So we have similar hand features. So it mightn't be very evident on bats because um, they're hidden within their wings, but they have four fingers and one thumb as well, just like us. Um, other things that bats have that we have that a lot of people um, don't realize is, yes, they do have eyes and ears, just like us. Uh, also might be visible, but they have arms, feet and knees as well. And they have fur, like mentioned, but we might say hair instead of fur, but it's sim the it's same thing pretty much. Um, so the main difference we don't have is bats have a leathery uh, wing membrane and a tail. So humans don't have tails anymore, but we did a long, long time back. Um, so there's some similarities and some differences. Um, so bats are across the world compared to Ireland. So there's about 1400 species of bats um, throughout the world. Um, that makes up 20% of all mammals. So they, um, they're quite a significant uh, group of species. Um, they're found throughout the world, so you can see the map there, uh, the colouring. So they're more um, abundant in tropical areas where it's red, and then up to where um, Ireland is in the green, um, there's less species. Um, so they're found everywhere bar up in the Arctic and in kind of sandy, dry deserts. Um, in Ireland, we have nine species that are resident, so they're ones that are here throughout the year or breed. And what's important is that all bats have um, special protection in Ireland. So they, they have higher protection than um, a lot of our other species. So we'll go through some of the bat species. So I'll do them to different groups. So we'll go through the nine. Um, the first ones are the pipistrelle groups. So they're made up of um, bats like the common pipistrelle, and the soprano pipistrelle, and the natusius pipistrelle. So from the images there, you can see they look all quite similar. They're basically um, small, um, dumpy um, bats, and they just look like big balls of fur. Um, so they're um, some of the most common species we have in Ireland, but they're also the smallest. So they're only about three to four centimetres. So if you can see in the photo there, um, that's a Natusius pipistrel. And you can basically fit um, an adult into a matchbox. So they're incredibly small uh, bats. 
they're very um they weigh hardly anything as well um about five to six grams so it's the same um weight basically as a euro coin so they're incredibly light if you ever come across a bat uh, uh, especially these guys and pick them up you hardly notice them at all now they um they eat quite a lot so they're for a small little animal they eat quite a lot um so the soprano pipistrels can eat anywhere between 1500 and 3000 small um insects in, in a single night so they have to eat a lot a lot of small insects uh, to keep themselves warm and um and fish and be able to fly and out of all the bat species um, these three um, uh, um, pipistrel species are the ones that tend to end up in people's houses the most. So these are the bats that um, people um, have um, most interaction with. So they are our smallest species. So we will then jump to our largest one, uh, which is the Leisler bat. And um, so it is our largest one, but you'll see now it's not much bigger than most of our other bats. Um, if you ever come across a Lysler bat, you'll see it has this very distinctive um, golden um, hair. Um, so it has this big um, um, kind of glob of hair all around its head and belly. And so people often think that it looks like a bit like a mini lion. So, but they're not as dangerous as a lion um, at all. So it is the largest one, but it's um, the pipistrels are about four, three to four centimeters. These guys are five to seven. So it's the wings and bats that make them look bigger, but they're actually quite small mammals. So the five to seven centimeters is about the same length as an adult's thumb. So if you looked at your parents or your teacher's thumb, um, that's as big as, as bats get in Ireland. Um, the Leisler is the bat you're most likely going to see at um, still during the day at sunset. So they are the first bat that emerges when they go out looking for food. And they fly quite high up into the um, sky as well. So you can still see them when, it's, it's, um, when there's a bit of blue sky out, so at twilight. Um, historically, they've been confused with other birds that are, with birds that are flying, I should say. So uh, the photo on the left is uh, a Leisler bat high up in the sky. And what's sharing the space around the same time are swifts. So swifts returning back to their roosts. Um, they're flying around at the same height. So kind of look similar when you um, look at them um, from, from afar itself. Um, so Sopranos, they feed on kind of um, small little um, uh, insects, um, like midges, and um, beetles feed on a little bit larger. Um, usually um, beetles is the most common. So they're, they fly high up because they're feeding off insects that are on um, the top of trees. So they come down, glide, and then pick up um, beetles and um, other insects uh, that you get right up at the top of the trees. So staying with large bats, the next one is brown long-eared bat. Um, as the name suggests, it has incredibly long ears. So it's um, the ears can make up a third of the whole um, bat's height. So um, it's three to four centimeters. So um, so they they're very big compared to other bats, but if if they were humans, it'd be like if our ears were the size of our legs. So we would, we would also look very funny if we were walking around with ears um, that big. Um, historically, these bats live in old woodlands. So bat, um, trees that have um, large cracks or holes. Um, with woodpeckers now in Ireland, um, they're creating a lot more habitat for these bats. So these bat species hopefully will benefit from woodpeckers um, that have come back into Ireland, creating more habitat for them. Um, because often where we find them in, in really old historic buildings, uh, often in churches, actually. So when we go um, uh, recording these at nighttime, we often have to spend a lot of time walking around uh, churches and graves, which is a bit spooky, um, which leads to kind of uh, people's fears and things of like that of bats. But they're, but they're quite harmless. Um, now, the reason we go to the roost is because we don't... Um, often see these bats because they actually are foraging in amongst the trees. So they're flying in amongst the branches. So we don't actually um, see them uh, that often. Now, signs that you might have brown long bats in a building is if you see um, wings of moths and butterflies. So they eat very large um, insects. And they, what they do is when they catch the um, moths, they bring it back to a feeding area. And they basically are only interested in eating the juicy middle part of the insects. 
and there's no food at all or energy in the um, wings. So they just drop those on the ground. So if you see, see big piles of wings of moths and butterflies inside a building, it's a good um, indication that you most likely have brown long-eared bats in there. So it's something to look out for when you go around to all these other buildings. Now, another group of bats are the meiotis bats. And this name leads to a lot of misunderstanding of bats. So meiotis just means um, mouse ear-like. So basically, um, look, uh, all bats kind of have round ears. So I'm not sure why meiotis bats um, have been particularly called out to look like mouse ears. But like I said, um, bats are, aren't rodents, so they're not related to mice or anything like that. So it's a bit of a, um, a wrong name. So there's three species of myotis bats in Ireland. So the most common one you'll come across is the bintons, uh, also called the water bat. And so like the name suggests, it's found around water bodies. So they feed up and down rivers and smooth lakes. So they fly very close to the surface of the water. They have incredibly large feet, larger than the other bat species we've seen, and they scoop insects that are um, on the water surface. So that might be mayflies or water beetles um, or caddisflies. And um, they scoop them up and then uh, feed on them. If, because they spend a lot of time on the water, there is a chance they might fall in. Um, so they have very limited swimming. So they swim very badly, but it's good enough for them to get out of the um, trouble basically. Um, so they roost generally in historic stone bridges um, or any stone building really that backs up to rivers or lakes. So it could be castles or it could be like old Georgian houses that have stones. So these stone um, bridges are really, really important that we protect them um, so that obviously we can still use them for us getting across but it's really important that we leave enough holes and cracks um, in these um, bridges um, so that the Dalbentons can go in there and um, have their young and be safe um, during the day. So our two other species um, that are very underrecorded are a natter's bat and our whiskers bat. Um, so the whiskers bat is called so because it looks like it has whiskers, but it just has um, very, very unkept hair. So I think probably Scruffy bat might have been a better name than whiskered bat. But um, these are both the least understood bats in Ireland. They're very difficult to survey for. Um, we do know that they are woodland bats, um, edge of woodlands. And in the case of whisker bats, sometimes you can see them along the edge of rivers, but they're not over the river like, um, like the Dowbinton's bat itself. So they're very tricky ones. So there's a lot we don't actually know about these bats. We, we know very little about their populations and very little about their ecology. So it's, um, we still have lots to learn about our bat species and particularly these two. So at the moment in Ireland, we're trialing um, new survey techniques to see if we can understand them a bit more because quite possibly they're more common than we think and we're just overlooking them. So they're kind of the first eight species. So the nine species of bat we have, it's quite special. It's the lesser horseshoe bat. And um, the lesser horseshoe bat is, is one of our rarest bats. So it's, there's only about, um, well, that's uh, that slide's old. <laughs> I think the last census we did last year, it's about 1500 now. So we found a few more bats down in West Cork in the last uh, year or so. So we've um, a bit more than we think. So about 1,500 um, individuals, so it's quite low compared to other mammals. Um, they're only found in the western counties, so if you're lucky to live anywhere between Cork and Mayo, um, we have the lesser horseshoe bats um, in these areas. Um, historically, they would have been in other counties, but at the moment, we're, they're just in the west, but they are increasing, so we are um, getting some benefits um, with the populations increasing, but there is still a lot of threats for our bats, particularly these ones. Um, the populations in Ireland are internationally important, um, which means that we have to create um, special areas of conservation for them. So me um, in the Burn and Trish and Clarny, um, both national parks um, are have special protection for these um, bats. So unlike the other bats that just have protection to where they live and the species, uh, the horseshoe bat, we actually protect the whole landscape as well, where they're found in, because um, they're quite rare in Europe and Ireland has quite an, a significant population. So the name horseshoe is um, a funny one, really. 
And it all comes to down to its nose. So you can see the picture there on the left. It has a very unusual nose um, compared to us. It's almost like our nose if we could put it inside out. So they have these special nose flaps. So it's just special areas of skin around the nose. And the, the reason they have this is to help them when they're foraging for um, food at night. So I'll talk a bit about how all that species um, forage and I'll, I'll come back to um, how Les Horshbat used the nose leaf. But it's a special adaptation they have for getting around and finding what they want to eat. Compared to all of our other bat species, it's the only one that hangs freely and wraps its, um, its body with its wings. So a lot of people think a lot of bats do this, but it's only the um, bats in the horseshoe family do this um, across the world. So our other bats kind of just huddle in corners or in cracks. And these guys hang in the open um, and they wrap around um, their, their wings around their faces, basically because they're lights and stuff. So they, they really, out of all our um, bats, they, they don't like light being shone on them the most. Um, the reason they hang freely is because unlike our other bats, they actually have really poor um, knee joints. So they can't actually crawl. So all of our other bat species fly and land and then crawl into spaces, unless a horseshoe bat has to fly into a building. And then basically they do a somersault in the air so they can land then onto the ceiling so they can hang. So they're very um, athletic um, um, bat species. Um, so because of their unusual ecology and physiology, we find them then in basically ruined buildings. So this is um, an old stable building near one of the nature reserves in Clare and it has um, about 200 lesser horseshoe bats um, in the summer months. Um, and that's a, quite a large breeding population for the entire of County Clare. Uh, we find them in castles, in like up in the chimneys, um, historic houses and basements, um, sometimes in stone cottages as well. Um, I think down in Clarny, there's a lot of stone cottages that have them. And then you find them in caves, mostly in winter, but you can find them in caves in the um, summer as well. So how do bats um, fly around the night? So they use this um, system of echolocation. So you mightn't be familiar with the term echolocation, but it's very similar to sonar and kind of maybe how um, whales and dolphins um, um, find their food and, and navigate as well. So basically what they're doing is the bats are basically making a high pitched squeaks. So they're making that by clicking their jaws or their teeth or through their nose as well. So all around their nasal cavity, they're making high pitched squeaky noises. They go out in waves like sonar and then they hit up obstacles. So that might be trees or insects or buildings or humans even. And then the returning waves then um, give information to the bat about what's in the area. So if there's insects around, if there's maybe a predator around they want to avoid. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's a very useful tool. Um, so some bat species can use this to determine the insect size. So brown longyards do this because they're only interested in large insects. So they only um, want to find bots and butterflies. So they can use this to determine how big the insects are around and then uh, go and chase and hunt those ones. Um, in the case of the lesser horseshoe bat, that special flap on their nose, um, that allows them um, also to term, determine direction of where the bats are. So they can tell if they're upwards or downwards from them, or if they're east or west and things like that. So it's a, they all have different, basically um, the horseshoe bat, the, the nose flap is basically like a big antennae, um, just given a lot of information. So I'll show you in this um, animation just roughly what it looks like. So this is a horseshoe bat. And their favorite food is um, small uh, flies, so dipteras. Um, so it emits its high squeaking voice in the red marks there. It bounce, it'll bounce off every obstacle and then the returning echoes gives a lot of information. So from this now we can say there's trees below it, there's an insect off there um, in front of it. And from that then it can fly around and then devour all the insects it has. And then they get a really nice meal. So how, do we know bats are around or how can we tell? So we um, have pretty poor hearing um, as a come. Uh, um, we hear in the range of 15 to 20 um, uh, um, hertz, kilohertz, um, which is quite low and bats emit at higher frequencies. So bats um, start at 22 and go up to 113 kilohertz. 
So 22 is where we hear Leisler bats. And the only humans that can hear 22 are babies and uh, toddlers. So possibly when we were very, very young as babies and toddlers, we might have been able to hear Leisler bats flying around. But often when we're out at nighttime, we might hear the wing flapping. Um, but often it's just we might see the bats flying around us, but we never get to hear them. So to um, for us to know what bats and what bat species are, we have um, things called bat boxes. So like the picture there on the right. And that basically um, has a tuning box. So you can see there it goes from 15 to 130 kilohertz. So all the bat species um, um, basically are chattering, talking, hunting at different frequencies. Um, so in the case of our common pipistrelle, it's at 45 kilohertz. So we tune the box to 45, and then we hear the unique sound um, for that individual bat. And we do that working all the way up to 113, which is where we have lesser horseshoe bats. So they're, they have the highest pitch out of all our bats. So the bats all produced um, different cells and frequencies, and they're quite different. And that's how we can tell when we're surveying which bat we're looking at. So I'm going to play now um, three um, or bat species, and they're all very, very distinctive. So we'll start with lesser horseshoe bats first. Lesser horseshoe bat tuned to 110 kilohertz. So that's the lesser horse bat, it's a warbly call, and we'll compare it now to um, a common pipistrelle. Common pipistrelle tuned to 45 kilohertz. So that's the common pipistrelle that makes a pippy, um, poppy sound. Daw Benton's bat tuned to 35 kilohertz. So this is Daw Benton's the water bat. So they're quite distinctive. So you can hear the Daw Benton's bat. It sounds like almost a crackling noise, kind of sounds like when you start um, um, a fire and the kind of um, kindling noise. And then pipistrels, like they say, that's where they get their name, pipistrel. It makes, makes these pippy poppy uh, noises. And then Lesser Horseback sounds completely different for the rest of them. It sounds almost like a computer game. These kind of warbly noises uh, sounds very, very um, um, uh, um, strange noise. So that's kind of our, our bat species and uh, just kind of a brief introduction to them. Um, there's some myths around bats that I'd like to uh, dis uh, swayed you with. Um, the first one you always hear is that they drink blood. So you'd be good, good to know out of our nine spice, nine bat species, um, they're all insect eaters. So they're all eating insects. Um, so there's no blood. So they're not coming for us or anything like that. Um, you hear bats are blind quite a lot. So you hear people saying you're blind as a bat. Um, bats have the same eyesight as us. So they're colored. They see colored um, the spectrum just like us. So like us, if we go out at night without any torch or anything like that, sure we can, we can see it hardly anything at nighttime. So same with bats. So that's why they've developed echolocation to, to get around. Um, if they always say bats get stuck in your hair. So they don't, they have no interest in us at all. They can't eat us, so they have no interest in us. Um, so echolocation, they might, you might see some people will say bats have scooped down towards them. They're not really, they're probably chasing an insect and we're just in the way really. Um, so I've never heard or ever seen in all my years of bats getting stuck in the hair. Uh, you always hear that bats have disease and things like that. So there's no um, diseases that bats have that's, um, um, that could affect humans, um, especially rabies. We don't have rabies in Ireland and our bats don't have them either. And another one is that they're not important. Now, they're very, very important. So the bats in Ireland are all insect eaters. They're controlling our insect numbers. So they're really important for balancing our ecosystems. So they're making sure that there isn't too many insects that might damage our trees and shrubs or flowers. And also for us, if we didn't have bats, we'd have very unpleasant summers um, because we would just be being eaten by biting um, insects all the time by our, our rivers and lakes. So they're very, very important and doing really, really important jobs. Um, so we should um, do all we can to help them. So it, sometimes it might feel a bit uh, overwhelming how we can help bats or any of our animals, but there's a lot of simple things everyone can do. So one of them is to turn off lights. 
So outdoor lights, um, any lights in your windows, when we don't need them anymore, turn off our lights. Don't have lights um, onto like projecting onto our roofs and things like that. Um, so all those things will help that. So that'll create those dark spaces they need to forage and get around. And also so that um, it doesn't drive insects away as well. So light can impact on insects. Um, important to protect our trees and hedgerows, even in urban areas. So it's, bats aren't just in rural areas. We have a lot of bats that live in cities and towns. So it's really important that we um, uh, connect up different habitats throughout our towns and cities and also to our rural areas. So we can plant trees and hedgerows and maintain them, keep them bushy, and that'll create corridors for bats to fly and also will bring in insects. Um, letting our grasses grow um, for wildflowers, so that increases insect numbers and then that provides food for bats. Um, you can put up bat boxes as well and put up around schools and in woodlands in our communities. That creates just extra protection areas in case they get caught out in rain. And the most important thing you can do is go around and tell everyone about how amazing bats are and everything you learned today. Um, and especially about all the myths that go around them. And you can tell them that they're all untrue and they're really, really important. And basically um, go out on bat walks when there's bat walks in your area and uh, just enjoy what's happening in the nighttime. So that's just a quick whistle tour around um, bats in Ireland. Um, so thanks for listening and hope you enjoyed it. That was great, Eamon. Thank you so much. Um, I loved, yeah, dispelling some of those myths there. Um, really brilliant and great to see so many amazing pictures of the bats. Um, so what we might do now, guys, is um, if people have questions, um, we can ask um, in the chat box now. Um, and uh, myself and Rob will have a look through them maybe and uh, um, ask them to. Um, Eamon and Trisha. Um, so we'll give you a sec now to pop them in. Are there, are there any already there? There's Rob? two questions in there already, and one for each of you. So one uh, class wants to know if the eagles are hurt when you tag them, and another yeah. class wants to know if uh, if bats bite people. <laughs> um, I suppose for the eagles, um, no, if they're they're not hurt at all. Um, I was actually holding two of the eagles while they were being tagged, and they didn't even flinch, so they don't feel the the tags being put on, thankfully. So no uh issues there with animal welfare or or pain. So they're all fine, thankfully. Um, so I've handled a lot of bats. Um, so it's about how you handle them. They have very uh, their teeth are very small and kind of pin-like, and that's because they are eating insects. So um, bats basically can't break our skin. So the Irish ones, anyways, like there's obviously larger ones in tropical areas that potentially could bite, but I think people probably aren't handling those ones as much. So no, our ones are fine. They, they can't break our skin. I've handled them loads of times. Um, there's no diseases out of Irish bats, so they're um, you, you, we can handle them no bother. Bats... Joe, like I know, like people probably like worried about Joe and viruses and things like that. It's most likely that humans are going to infect bats because they're so closely related. And so when we had coronavirus, when we were trying to do our winter counts, uh, we had to wear full body gears because we were really worried that we would be passing on um diseases to them. So they're there. So the bats in Ireland are all pretty clear. Um, they're all very they're clean. There's no diseases that we need to worry about. Basically, if you get large numbers in your house, they can leave a smell. So it's more so you they can be quite smelly if they're in large numbers. But um, smells don't smell won't kill us. <laughs> there's a there's a good question here that uh, ties into both of you guys. Would white-tailed eagles eat bats? <laughs> mm. <laughs> what do good you think? Question. Trisha? Yeah, um, well, you go yeah. in. Well, yeah, well, you could, I, I, well, I'll talk about, like, we know that in urban areas, um, gulls have learned um, where bat, bat roosts are. So the, I, I, I know, I'm not sure if there's any documentation in Ireland, but I think in the UK, some urban gulls have basically found where there is nest, uh, where like in tree pipes or bats are. And they have, I'm not sure if they're just, if they're killing them and actually eating them, but they are predating on them. Um, um, but um, some birds of prey might, but I'm not sure 
do Trish can maybe she knows if Waitili goes across Europe, maybe do. But I don't know yeah, about that. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know um like bats would be the food of some eagles, but maybe white tailed eagles might be a bit big. The the bats might be a bit small here in Ireland. Yeah. Um, I know there is a site that we have that is a bat roost and we have a barn owl nesting there as well mm. um, so there was a bit of concern that the, the owls might predate upon the bats there um, so no, like I know eagles are known to eat bats but just in terms of the size of the eagles we have in Ireland and the size of bats I would imagine that they'd probably be going for something slightly slightly bigger like fish and, and things like that uh, we have a lot of questions yeah. coming in, so maybe we'll try and fly through um a few of them. Um, have you got one picked out, Rob? Yeah. So why do bats avoid the sun, and uh, what would happen to them if they were in the sunlight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so they're not vampires. They will. They're not going to um disintegrate at the sun. Um, you can. They they're basically they just are used to flying around nighttime. So it'd be like us if we were doing night shifts all the time and never saw the sun. We would the second we see the sun, it would be it'd be almost like um so overpowering to see. So like um our Lester Horshabat is um sensitive to the sun at all. So any kind of light and um upsets them. So their their eyes are just really sensitive uh, to it because they're so adapted to flying around at nighttime. Um in really hot days you will see bats flying around in the daytime. Uh, that's because they're panting, so they're trying to cool off. And that's going to be an issue with climate change because um, the issue now is that we spent maybe in, in sites where we've been detecting bats, we spent the last 30 years trying to keep them warm and draft free. And now we are coming up with ways of how to create cool spaces for them. So if you, you often, maybe in June, July, you will see them, particularly young ones as well, the really young ones, um, they can overheat and they might leave the roost and that's when you may find them on the ground and things like that. But sometimes you can see them flying around. So they, they can fly around. Um, obviously, it's not ideal. They're, they're, they don't like it. They're generally or probably going to try and find, if they're in a building, they're going to try and probably find somewhere like a, on, in a shady tree. So they can fly, but um, they prefer to avoid it. So but nothing will happen to them if they're out in the sun. They don't need sunblock. No, no, no. <laughs> Um, so there's a question here for the Eagle Project. That, um, Old Castle are wondering how long the project will last for. Um, that's a great question. So I think um, there aren't any further plans past phase two at the moment. So I think this next batch of eagles may be um, the last one at the moment. Now, it's not to say that it won't ever happen again. Um, it's just that I suppose they'll monitor numbers for the next few years. And then, you know, we'll kind of go from there and see see what's needed after that but at the moment the second phase is up until this year so um watch this space i suppose and we'll see how things go in the future see how successful it's going it, it seems to be exactly. going very well already which mm -hmm. is great there's a few Absolutely. questions about size so how big is the biggest bat and how big is the biggest eagle i suppose is going to kind of answer both of those <laughs> So I'll start with the bat. So the, the biggest bat is the Lysler bat that we have in Ireland. So in Ireland, it's a Lysler bat, which is that size, size my tum. Um, if you go to um, Australia, you have flying foxes and they are, I'm not sure the measurements I've seen them in Australia. They, they're quite large. They're probably. Empty or arm. Yeah. At, at least yeah. an arm size. Yeah. And they're, they're ginger and, um, so they actually do look like actually like um they look like a fox called hanging from the tree basically so they're quite impressive so that's as big yeah as I was fortunate get. enough to see some myself but yeah um they're they're quite large yeah 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 <laughs> and you wouldn't want one of those in your house <laughs> <laughs> um I suppose for the eagles the white-tailed eagle is the largest eagle in Ireland so a wingspan of. 2.4 meters i don't know the exact wingspan of the largest eagle in the world i have to say i'd have to check it up um, and i'm not sure would it be the bald eagle maybe or i'm not sure off the top of my head that it would be something i'd have to check i'm afraid or you say it just means that people can do some research on their own yeah, their exactly own that's that. it <laughs> yeah uh claire did you see any more there to ask yeah, well, yeah, there's there's lots coming in here. Um, give you guys another one each, maybe. Um, so for bats, we've got a question here of how many bats are in a litter, 
Um, and then on eagles, how fast do the white-tailed eagles fly? How fast? Can they fly? Yeah. Um. So with bats, um, the mothers give birth to just one pup every um a year, and not every, um. So the bats can some bat species can live quite long, so some of them can live 30, 40 years. Um, so they won't breed every year either. So a female that gives birth this year, she might decide next year she won't breed. Um, so she might take it off just to get her fitness back up. So she'll just spend the summer um, eating basically and Joe getting um, getting her weight back up. So they just give birth to one pup. So um, so one one female, one pup. Um, and that's all. So, it's, it's, so that's when you have species that just give birth to one pup and not every year when things go wrong, like a roof site is damaged or something like that, that's when the bat population can um, decline. So um, it's it's a, it's it's good to focus on one um, young, but it can be risky as well. Same, okay. Um, so for the white-tailed eagle, I think the maximum speed they can fly is about 70 kilometers an hour. So that's pretty fast for a bird, I would say. Um, and it's that big wide wingspan that they have as well, like that helps them to go up high in the air and actually um, kind of just soar and catch the, the thermals as well. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty impressive, I would say, for the size of them. Yeah. Yeah, right. Scotland and back quick enough. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. you'd be surprised how fast <laughs> they can make it over there for sure. Yeah. You'd want some good tailwinds. <laughs> there, there's another question there for the the. Uh, bats uh, are out bat boxes so where could a school get one and or even if they were to make them is there you know somewhere they could download the dimensions so they could make bat boxes yeah yeah they can um so if they go onto bat conservation ireland's website um they have um tools there and with downloads on how to make the boxes so the the most common bat box you make is kind of for the common species like the pipistrels ones and that they're quite easy. You just get one piece of plywood and just make six cuts and then staple, uh, not staple, screw it all together and then apply it. So that's the easiest one you can do. There's other more specialist ones um, you can get, hard to get in Ireland, but the standard ones are are are, are good enough. Um, the main thing as well is like, Joe, um, you can just protecting your old rotten trees. Don't take them down just because they look like they're dying and things like that. So you can create natural spaces as well. But yeah, no, um back as back conservation Ireland would be a good place to start. Um, um to um have a good download there and, and step by step how to make it. Great. And I've put that into the chat there as well. So um schools can find it. Yep. There's another question there about the eagles. How much do they weigh? You there, Trish? She might have frozen. Are you back? Did you hear that, Trish? No, sorry, my connection just seemed to cut out a couple of times there. Apologies. <laughs> no worries. Was there so, another question? Yeah, a question about how, how much do the eagles weigh? Oh, yeah. So I know the juveniles, when we weighed them um, at the tagging, were about 1.4 kilos. Um, I haven't weighed an adult. I'm sure the information is probably out there, but... Uh, yeah, I'd have to look that one up as well. Sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head. I suppose it's harder to weigh an adult because, you know, oh, yeah. it could we be would... in Scotland one day and Ireland the next. Exactly. <laughs> they wouldn't be as easy to um to to capture and weigh as we, you know, when they're a juvenile, it's it's much easier process. Before we release when we're doing the tagging and all that, we we check all of their their measurements as well, like the wingspan and and weight and things like that. So I'm sure there's probably some information out there on it, but I don't have it to hand, I'm afraid. Yeah. And and there's a question about why do bats cover their faces? So it's it's just a lesser harsh bat that does it. The rest of our bats, they generally huddle in like maybe a corner of a building. So none of the other ones cover their faces. So it's just it's just bats in the horseshoe family. So just lesser horseshoe in Ireland, but there's greater horseshoe in Europe. And it's just because they're photos and stuff. So Often they're in like um buildings like um buildings that human use, so stables and you know, coach houses or Joe you know, in churches or even they're in old uh, basements of of manor houses. So basically we'll go in and the first thing we'll do is turn on the light. So they do that to just to 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 cover their eyes. So they're basically just any kind of light that's coming from natural light, but also human med light. Um just makes them really sensitive and it, it upsets them. So they just do that just to make sure that they're in kind of a nice um, dark area all the time when they're resting or even when they're awake during the day, just so that they're 
they're not their um, own personal videos. blackout blinds yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's like <laughs> i was wearing a face cute. mask at night yeah, yeah. <laughs> like when somebody opens your curtains in the morning and you pull your yeah. doom over your over your head yeah yeah we've yeah, all been yeah. there when mom wants us up early and she pulls yeah. the blinds open and opens the window yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, they, related to that then that's the same bat that we have in ireland that hangs upside down so there's a few questions yeah. about well why do bats hang upside down yeah um well it, with the well there's a few reasons because um well they can't hang by their hands because um so our fingers are in the arms but their ones are covered in the wings so the only um the only claws they have on the wings are at the tops of their thumbs so they can own, so they can use the thumbs to move around to crawl so why they hang and why so most of them don't hang most of them just are kind of attached um kind of this way and the horseshoe bat hangs because of its knees so it has this weird um situation where it has um almost like double jointed knees and which prevents it from crawling so basically because they cannot land on a building and crawl into like a, an opening like the other bats ones or other bat species do they have to fly in so they always have to be um ready to actually drop down and fly so they hang upside down so when they're ready to move or if a predator comes they just um release their um claws and their legs drop down and then they're ready to fly so it's just basically getting them into position to um to fly um i imagine they have the same issues that we would have been upside down um so they must have a lot of there must be a lot of strain on their hearts to keep the blood away from their head as well so i imagine they've, they they probably have that that's probably an issue for them but that's the main reason so it's it just be, um it's just because lesser arch bats um because of their their knees they can't crawl it's just so they can drop down and fly and get away from predators brilliant thanks for now we've gone way over time um but there's been so many brilliant um questions. It's it's amazing that um we've managed to get through so many. Um but we might um leave it there for today and just to say thank you so much um to everybody for coming and for all of your questions and comments. Um and also thank you so much to Eamon and to Trisha. Um really, really um interesting talks and it was great to get um so much information on our bats and our white-tailed eagles. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed it um, and that we see you again at another webinar this week. Um, like I said, don't forget to check out um, the event page and get some ideas for getting outside in the sun this afternoon. Um, so thanks again, everybody, um, and we hope you enjoyed the rest of Biodiversity Week. <laughs>